Welcome, I'm Michael Bickard. Thanks for joining me today as we explore concepts with the objective of improving your management skills and growing your business. Now pause the video so that you can grab a notepad and a pen because I want you to make a commitment that you will jot down some notes, some sort of action item that you will implement in your business to improve your business, to drive your business forward. That's what this is all about. That's why we do this. Now let's explore this concept that words matter. I think you understand this. Words do matter, of course. Now, I'm a big proponent of free speech, and I'm not referring today about political correctness and those types of things. I believe that uh, it's really important that people should have the right to dissent and to disagree with one another respectfully and that's how progress is made by us sharing opinions that's not today's topic instead i want you to think of yourselves as wordsmiths your goal in business this topic in the context of business is about using the right words to optimally convert your customers and to achieve objectives so that might sound obvious. And today what I want you to do after the video, I want you to give some thought and reflect in your business where you might be able to make some improvements, what words that you're using, where you might get a better, a more desirable result by using a different word. Now this is not a foreign concept to those of you who are in sales or who have had a sales background and I want to remind you again, if you are an entrepreneur, if you own a business, if you, if you are in management, then you are automatically in sales. Your ability to persuade and influence others is in large part going to determine your success. So in effect, you are in sales always. But if you're in professional sales, um, you know, officially in a sales role, then this concept of being a wordsmith. The way that some artists may work in clay or paint or metals, you need to, in sales, you need to work in words. But you also need to think about this in other aspects of the business besides sales. So let's just cover some of the, the, the notion. I'll give you a few examples, but the real Thing that I want you to do is to think of this in your business. The purpose of this video is not for me to give you some comprehensive list of words that some people use and alternatives that are more uh, effective. I mean, I don't know in your business. And in fact, some of the examples I give you may be more effective in the reverse direction, depending on the situation. But I remember in sales, we used to discuss, let's not refer to the uh, contract as a contract. Instead, it's an agreement. It's paperwork. We'll, we'll fill out the paperwork. Or we would, instead of saying, I need your signature, we might say something like, I just need you to authorize this. I just need your agreement or I just need your autograph. So these are words that they elicit a different emotional and psychological response from the person that is hearing them. You know, words like contract and signature can be very scary and they can make people think of a big time commitment and risk. And for those who are risk averse in sales or as customers rather, those in sales want to make sure that we don't stir up those emotions and we don't psychologically impact and do the opposite of what we're trying to do. Instead, we want to try to use words that are, you know, gentle. <laughs> The, the words that are disarming and really lead to conversions, right? Lead to the desired state. Some other examples are, it's not a purchase, it's an investment. Or you don't buy, you invest. So you might in, in a conversation with a customer, in a communication with a customer, because this isn't always just when it's a face-to-face. -face. So this could be in a written communication, something on your website. So we'll give some other examples. This is sales and marketing because, you know, they're very closely related, especially for those of you who operate in a more virtual e-commerce environment. You may not be saying these words out loud, but what about your copy that's on your website? What about the copy that makes it into your video communications and communicates with your customers. 
Are you using the right words? Um, instead of a commitment, we're looking for an agreement. Instead of asking your customer to commit to something, you might encourage them to secure or reserve a particular position or product or inventory. Colloquially, we speak of the fine print, but I would encourage you to consider instead of using terms like the fine print, the details. And wherever you're using terms like price, is it practical that maybe you could uh, change the, the word cost or price to value or something related to value? So we've already said that this is sort of more intuitive in the context of sales and marketing, and you can appreciate that. There are some words that are more desirable that will elicit feelings and emotions that are better for converting customers to, or converting prospective leads to customers. But I want you to think of this in broader terms, in terms of management and your overall business. So let's think about some terms you may use in managing every day that you might want to consider changing as well for the same reason, for the same objective. You're trying to influence in management. You're trying to influence your team and other stakeholders. Even if those stakeholders aren't customers per se, they are people that you will benefit. You will be better able to achieve your objectives, your management objectives, and you'll be more effective if you're able to influence them. So think about words that you're using in management on, and are there things, human resource related or other types of management uh, roles that you fill in your business, are there things that you're saying and you've sort of been carelessly using words and not realizing that you can optimize for the feelings that people get as they receive them. Here are some examples that I think of that um, they matter. Words matter is what I'm trying to say. So uh, here are some examples. Instead of talking about employees, I like to refer to team members. And instead of the staff, I want to talk about the team or our community, our BMI community. These things matter. They mean something to me. So that don't think of this as disingenuous. These things, not only are you trying to become more influential, but you're trying to create a culture where we communicate in a way that people are more receptive. We're not stirring up people's dander and getting people defensive. And these, you might think of these as fairly benign examples. Remember in business, it's just little things. I'm not going to give you a magic pill and everything will change, but the degree to which you can make and affect very small changes every single day, you should because it's going to impact your success. So some other examples in management, we'll often talk about problems. I would encourage you to consider getting rid of the term problem and think of it as opportunities. The problem is an opportunity or a challenge. When you are communicating with somebody in a meeting or whatever. I've often heard people refer to or ask the question, what's your point? What's your point? I don't like that. I would prefer you said something like, what is your objective of what you're telling me? And that really helps me to understand where they're coming from. When you say, what's your point? It's sort of a adversarial way of wording it. It's more incendiary and people are are more apt to take on the defensive. So remember, we're trying to become more effective in communication and words matter. What are some other examples you can think of? One that's come up recently in discussions we've had internally is the term impossible. Or, you know, when somebody may be a little bit defeatist about something, they might say, well, that's impossible. I would encourage you to maybe share with your team. In our culture, we don't use the word impossible. Things are difficult. Things are challenging. Things may be perplexing, but they're not impossible. Where there's a will, there's a way. Another one that comes up in meetings and uh, uh, communications in the business is opinion. And it may be used in, the, in uh, an example like, well, that's your opinion. I would prefer to soften it by talking about somebody's perspective or their perception. Well, I can appreciate that's your perspective. You see how it's just a little bit easier. It softens the edges a little bit more than, well, that's your opinion. And of course, I used a little uh, different to tonality and facial expression, and there's a lot more to communication than just the words. Maybe we'll touch on that in just a moment as well. But start to think, 
What words are you using? And maybe are these bad habits, things that you've used all your life? And, and it can be just a word that, you know, in your mind, you didn't mean anything by it, but it has taken on a meaning or it's, it's taken on some sort of uh, adversarial effect in the way that people use it in our modern vernacular. So again, this isn't about being politically correct. It's about you acting in your self-interest, trying to improve your business, trying to improve your communications, trying to com uh, convert people, trying to, uh, when I talk about conversions in a sales and marketing aspect or context, you can really understand that, but also in management, you're trying to persuade people and influence people. That's a form of conversion. Another big one, an example in my organization, I don't like to use the word policy. I really avoid setting policy. Instead, let's talk about best practices or usual procedures, our standard procedure, our ordinary procedure, not a policy. Policy is something that, you know, watch my video on central authority. I really want to avoid having something stated as a policy as if it's written in stone and that it's uh, not flexible at all. Instead, we wanna think of best practices and our usual procedures, our standard operating procedure. That's very kind of technical way of wording it and maybe it doesn't just roll off the tongue in a, in a usual conversation, but I would say to somebody, if I was tempted to use the term policy, I would say, well, our best practice, we have found in best practice, in practice, this works best, this kind of thing. So these are some examples of management. And again, today, explore some of these things and, and what words are you using that may be not having the desired effect? And it may have never occurred to you that it's just little words. Now, a moment ago, I alluded to, and maybe I'll just touch on it a little bit more, that communication is not just words. So it's, it's predominantly words when you are sharing uh, written communication. And so think of these things in the context of your business whenever you are communicating via the written word. So an email message, it could be your marketing, like I said, your copy within your, your marketing materials on your website and so on, or any kind of communication, memo, newsletter, email campaigns, all this kind of stuff, whether it doesn't matter who you're communicating with, when it's the written word, you really want to pay attention to the words. Now, when it's the spoken word, of course, you want to focus on your tonality and your facial expressions, your body language and your gesticulation. You can watch my video on the inverse relationship between effective and efficient communication and think about that as well. But what I want you to think about today is are you getting the desired results or are you uh, experiencing some symptoms in your business where you know you talk to somebody and just you know it's like I don't think I got through. Is it possibly the words you're using? Are there some cultural differences? I've employed people who came from different parts of the world and I later found out that an expression we use might be considered rude in their culture or just the way we communicate in my local geography may not be considered as professional or um, really as effective as it would be elsewhere in the world. It, you can come across as rude and that kind of thing. And these, these cultural differences really matter in business. These are the types of things to think about. Just a couple more examples. What about when you are in, the, in your business through your maybe customer service interactions? And are there words that you're using that you want to maybe consider a different, an alternative that has a more desired effect? I think of the word satisfaction as being unacceptable. I try to use the word delight. So when we talk about customer satisfaction, I encourage my team to think about delighting customers. We don't really want a satisfied customer, of course, satisfaction is sort of the minimum. At minimum, we want to meet their expectations, which is satisfaction, but ideally we would exceed their expectations. We would wow them, we would delight our customers. Another one is the word customer itself. And this really depends on the business. I mean, I would say that our clients who are in the healthcare industry do not want to think of their, their revenues coming from customers, although in effect, from a commerce point of view, it is a customer, it's a patient. 
So what kind of organization do you have? And is it a customer? Is it a client? Is it a parishioner? Is it a donor? If you run a nonprofit, think of the various words. And sometimes in your organization, people get hung up on using the word customer. And that can be a little offensive. I think that some healthcare uh, patients, for example, might not want to be thought of as a customer. Or if you were in a nonprofit context um, and you thought about somebody who was uh, donating money, are, are they really a customer? They're, they're a donor. So think of those types of things as well. Also, just the, the, the term company, what about organization as opposed to uh, a company? or business, an organization. So I'm just, I, like I said, I didn't want to make this a comprehensive list of examples. I just wanted to get you sort of the juices flowing and get your mind racing and thinking about things. And maybe you think, well, this isn't that important. I'm telling you, words matter. It's all about conversion. It's all about persuasion. It's about influence and words do matter. So think, you're acting in your own self-interest. What can you do? to influence people more. So today's homework is for you to write down words that are uh, good examples for your business that you might want to consider changing. Take a look in your marketing materials. Maybe that's a good place to start. You can do some A-B testing. Maybe you take one word and you think, uh, well, we were using this word, but I wondered, I've always wondered if that really takes. Do people understand that? Or would this be better? And you can try it. You can have live testing, A-B testing. If you don't know how to do that, make sure you reach out to BMI and our marketing department. We can help you with that kind of thing. But this is a really good idea to, to test and see what the data supports. You will know, you will find that words do matter. Another one that I would encourage you to avoid is really technical terms. And there's nothing wrong. We've talked about this when we mentioned features and benefits. Technical terms are good as features, but people really want to focus on the benefits. So I've observed people who are communicating with customers and they're using, you know, what I call the, the show up and throw up alphabet soup, where they're talking about all the acronyms of the very, various technical features that are offered on a particular product. And that's just a mistake. It's not finding its mark. It's not influencing the customer the way it would. Instead, use words that are generating positive emotions and stirring up, you know, good feelings within your customer. As I mentioned earlier, it may seem obvious when you're talking about sales and marketing and trying to influence customers and increase your conversions that this is really important. And I think that is the primary place in your business that you'll use this. But beyond that, I want you to think of other areas in your business, human resources, other management, communications between department heads, in your meetings, what types of things are being said, what are some words that you want to avoid. And again, I would avoid sort of putting this as a rule or a policy in place. I would talk to my team and say, this is a best practice, that we're careful with our words. We, we use words that are descript, and they and we we believe in candor but we also want to use words that are not inflammatory that aren't necessarily going to get somebody's back up and and for some defensiveness think about this kind of thing and share this video with your team and get people to brainstorm i'd like to see in the comments if you can put some words that you sort of got rid of and what you've replaced them with. And again, this is not about political correctness. I think it's so important that you have an environment where in your in a culture in your organization where people can speak freely and they don't have to be worried about walking on eggshells. This is just about taking your game to the next level. So I don't want you slapping people on the wrist, so to speak, when somebody uses the wrong term, like somebody uses the term employee instead of team member. It's like, hey, 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 we don't do that around here. That is not the right approach to this. Instead, set an example as the leader, as a manager. One other thing that I thought of when I was um, deliberating this, and that is the use of profanity. There are some very, very successful people who very colloquially use profanity as part of their way of speaking and, and it seems to be part of their personality. In fact, there are times in my life when I did that as well. 
I discourage that. I think that that is not going to lead to the culture that you want in your organization. That might sound obvious, but those who use a lot of profanity just as their normal way of talking and they have all their lives and everything, they might disagree with me and they might say, no, 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 that, I, I, I'm going to be me. That's who I am and I don't mean anything by it. But we're trying to be as effective as possible. And there are some people who take great offense to that. Others, not so much. I can listen to these people. And there's a very famous podcaster who drops the F-bomb like it's going out of style. And, you know, I, I can listen to that and not be offended. And there is a very famous um, uh, promoter at the head of a mixed martial arts agency who is very commonly quoted as using a lot of profanity or if you hear him in an interview he's not shy about that that's uh, that's just who he is and that's how he emphasizes his point and everything i get that and you have to de determine the culture that you want in your organization i've worked for very different types of companies where one that is very acceptable and another it's not my i would i get you to look at this i think i would encourage you to go away from that and try to encourage and set an example. That's where I got off on this uh, topic was, was when I was saying set an example. And I remember with my team where I might use uh, some stronger language, some you know cursing or swearing or whatever to illustrate a point and it felt natural. And then later on and looking back at that, I, I kind of regret that. I, I don't I don't think that's an effective form of communication. And if words matter, then those words matter as well. Try to use words that with most of your audience, especially if you're speaking to a large um, group of people at once, you want to make sure that you're trying to use words that will uh, find their mark with everyone and you're acting in your own self-interest. You're trying to accomplish the objective you have of the communication and building relationships. And part of the communication or part of building relationship is the communication. The words do matter. So um, the last uh, point that I, I can think of off the top of my head on this topic is making sure that people take some pride in your product and they're referring to those things that, well, again, going back to features and benefits, using the terminology that matters you know we don't sell thingamajigs what is it that we represent what is our product or our service and really spend some time and and that's the place where with your sales and marketing team i'd be a little bit more firm in encouraging them to use proper terminology because i've heard people that maybe just don't take the time to learn about the product enough and then they're using nondescript terms and it's like, oh yeah, that thing, and, and we've got this uh, technology, and they don't know the term. I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, because earlier I said, don't show up and throw up with alphabet soup and giving them all these technical terms. But also, when you do have something that you want to communicate to a customer that is unique and different from the competition, you should use your, the right words and take the time to communicate that. I think that's everything I wanted to cover on this topic today, so I'm going to leave it at that. I would really like to see in the comments some of the examples that you've noted in your organization, some words that you try not to use, and what do you use instead? Are there some examples I gave that you disagree with? You've got a better alternative. Let's share these ideas with one another so that we can all learn from one another, because we need to learn from one another. Perpetual refinement. <laughs>